Amen. Please remain standing for scripture. We're in Judges 13. We're going to read verses 11 to 23. It's on page 273 of the Pew Bible. Judges 13, 11 to 23. On page, uh, on page 273. God's word is sufficient and authoritative. Let's look at it together. Starting in verse 11. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may eat of anything, she may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, or eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please, let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, so that when your words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat, with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. God's word goes out from his mouth. It does not return to him empty, but will accomplish what he desires and will achieve the purposes for which he sent it. Please be seated. You may be thinking that this passage sounds familiar, and you'd be right. Uh, we first looked at this passage and the example of Manoah's wife on Mother's Day. We saw that our faithful obedience directly impacts others. We saw that our true faithfulness is accurate to God's word and that true faithfulness is intentional and that God's love for us leads us to obeying him. The big idea that we walked away from on Mother's Day or walked away with on Mother's Day was that faithfulness can inspire faithfulness. For mothers, for fathers, for children, or anyone who wants to follow God, Manoah's wife is an example for us to follow. But there's this whole other person in this passage that we didn't really talk a lot about last time. Manoah was just, a part, uh, just as much of a part of uh, raising Samson and his faith in, in God is just as important. We need to study him as well. And even though this message is first directed to dads, we'll find that everyone can learn from this passage. But first, I want you to imagine a scenario with me. Imagine that you are at home, and you're sitting down for a meal. And you're just about to take your first bite when a friend runs in and tells you that your house is on fire. But you don't see flames, and you don't smell smoke. So do you understand that scene? Okay, let's take a, let's take a step back and watch what happens. In fact, we're going to see two possible reactions on your part. The first possible reaction that you see is that you give a little chuckle and you just go back to eating your food. Now, if you saw yourself do that, what would be your conclusion? You'd most likely decided that what your friend said wasn't true. That's the first possible reaction. But then you see a second possible reaction. Right after your friend tells you that your house is on fire, you jump up and both of you and your family, if they're with you, you run out of the house and you call the fire department. Now, if you saw yourself doing that, what would be your conclusion? Well, you most likely decided to trust your friend and protect yourself and your family. You see, the actions you took revealed what you believed in that moment. And of course, what you believed led to the actions you took. And I think this is something that we all easily understand. We understand that belief leads to action and that action reveals belief. In fact, that's our big idea for today. True belief leads to action action reveals true belief. It's a big idea. True belief leads to action, and action reveals true belief. I gave it to you right away this morning. This is basic to how we live in the world, and yet there could be a disconnect 
between this reality and how we live out our faith. Suddenly, once spiritual things are involved, many Christians divorce their belief from their actions. They may say that they believe that they should read the Bible, but they don't read the Bible. They may think that they believe prayer is essential to growing their relationship with God, but they don't pray. Same with confession, same with worship, same with evangelism. But because the truth is that true belief leads to action and action reveals true belief, we have to take a critical look at this phenomenon. See, if a Christian isn't reading a Bible on a regular basis, then their actions reveal that their true belief is different, that, that the Bible isn't important or needed in their life. Or if a Christian isn't praying on a regular basis, then their action reveals their true belief that prayer doesn't grow our relationship with God. See, their actions reveal their true belief. For, for these Christians, they believe that the Bible isn't important, or, and so they don't read it. Or they believe that uh, they, prayer isn't important, and so they don't pray. True belief leads to action. Action reveals true belief. And we can say that we believe something, but when the words and actions don't line up, we can quickly find out how empty words can be. And so today we're going to examine our lives in the same way that we're going to examine this passage. As we study through this passage, we're going to see what Manoah truly believed. We're going to see it because we'll see how he lived it out in his actions. And as we witness his beliefs on display, we should be putting our lives on display for ourselves. What do we truly believe? What do we notice about our actions? What do they reveal about what we truly believe? Not what we say we believe, but what we truly actually in the core of our being believe. If we want to change that, then what actions should we be taking that are in line with true Christian belief? Well, let's first remember the context that this chapter comes in. in verses 1 to 2 shows us that the example that we're going to see in Manoah didn't just happen in a vacuum. In fact, it didn't even happen in the greatest of conditions. The generation he and his wife were a part of were doing evil in the sight of God. Now, we talked about last time how there was this cycle in the history of Israel where they did this all the time. They sinned, they were disciplined, uh, they repented, and then they just started it all over again by sinning again. And so, as we look at putting belief into action, we first need to realize that these events aren't happening when, every, uh, when everyone around them is following God. In fact, everyone around them is against God. Now, we know what happens in the next few verses, just like we saw last time and Noah's wife is barren and the angel of the Lord appears to her. He gives her encouragement that she will indeed have a son, and, and there are certain instructions for her to follow. The angel leaves, and the woman goes to her, her husband and tells him everything that had happened. Look at verses 8 and 9. And say this. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. See, Manoah had just been told some wonderful news. His wife, whom he no doubt loves, had just been told... Uh, has just told him that he, she had a supernatural visit. And not only that, but they're going to have a child. Now look at his response. Does he scoff at her? Does he question her? No, he prays. He asks that God send the man of God again to teach them what to do with their future son. Now remember from last time that Manoah and his wife didn't realize until verses 20 and 21 that this was an angel of the Lord. So he calls him here a, a man of God. Now, some look at Manoah's prayer as kind of doubting what his wife said and needing some sort of sign of confirmation of her authenticity. But nowhere in his response does he say, if this is true, or, Lord, please confirm this message. In fact, we see in his words that he believed that the birth of his future son would definitely happen. And because he moves immediately from how his, his wife's pregnancy should go to what should happen after the child was born, we see that he understood and believed his wife. He believed that what God had told them. Now he wanted to know what to do next. And God answers his prayer. He sends the angel back to the woman, and she runs to get her husband. So look at verses 11 to 12. They say, And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. 
And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life, and what is his mission? Now notice that Manoah didn't delay. Right? He immediately gets up and responds to his wife and talks to the angel. And of course, there's always things that we can learn from this. When God shows up, everything else is unimportant. Rather than trying to fit God into our schedules, we should be willing to change our schedules around him. But notice something else. Manoah shows his confidence in the message he heard. He doesn't say, if your words come true. He says, when your words come true. I mean, we're seeing here evidence from Manoah's example that he believes this will happen. And the first thing we saw him do about it back in verses uh, uh, 8 and 9 is that he prayed to God about it. And so true belief leads to prayer, and that should be our first point for today. True belief leads to prayer. If we have a true belief in God, we would see ourselves praying to him and praying to him often. Because true belief in God knows that he is all-powerful and that he knows everything, it recognizes that he is concerned with us and and that in contrast to the greatness of God, we are frail. And we don't know nearly as much as he does. And so we would seek him. We would ask him for guidance. We would seek his will and his direction. We would turn to him for help, for forgiveness, and, and to praise him for his faithfulness. And that's why true belief leads to prayer. And praying would show our true belief. But I need to address something else that Christians can do. Just like the Pharisees of Jesus' day, some people can make a great show of their prayers. They pray loudly and in public to put themselves on display for everyone to see. And so we can remember that and say, well, Jesse, not all action reveals true belief. That's true. We can have actions without belief. But I would contend, at least for the Pharisees, that even their actions were showing their true belief. Because even in, in their example, their belief was that the praise of men is more important than God. And so they took actions to make sure that everyone would see what they were doing. Even if we don't see the belief, but we see the action, God knows what's in our heart. And for the Pharisees, he saw their prideful heart. But if someone truly wants to follow God, they'd be unconcerned with how others would perceive them. It's not other people that we are trying to please. It is God that we seek to please. There's a uh, saying that's that his previous instruction was enough. There didn't need to be anything added to it. God's word is sufficient. And the reason why Manoah should defer to his wife is shared at the end of verse 14. It is his wife who has been commanded to do these things, and she is the one who is responsible to obey. The angel is putting all the responsibility on the wife. And so an application point from that on Father's Day is, Dads, you just keep saying, go ask your mom. Okay, I'm just kidding. No, in reality, we need to understand that God's call on someone's life doesn't automatically become a call on our life, even if someone is as close to us as a spouse. But there is an implicit instruction in what the angel said, especially because of the relationship between Manoah and his wife. See, while she is the one who's been instructed, and, and while she is the one who is to obey, Manoah is in a position to help or harm that obedience. He's in a position where he could make her obedience easier by removing sources of temptation and, and supporting the decision she makes in conjunction with this command. He can help her by clearing the way for her. Q. 
keeping God's word is something that he can help her to do. And so true belief, as we see in Manoah's example here, true belief leads to seeking God's word. That's our second point for today. True belief leads to seeking God's word. Like Manoah, we need to seek guidance from the source. Just like with prayer, so too with the Bible, a true belief in God believes in his word. It recognizes that he works through his word to, to make us more like Christ. It recognizes that we are in desperate need of the truth that can only come from him. And so we would see ourselves reading the Bible. We would be trying to memorize parts of it. We would be working to apply it to our lives. Manoah sought to know more about his part and what was, uh, and what was going on and what to do. And to do that, he could only go to one place, God, who sent him an angel. We too have a task. Today, our task is to make disciples and, and to be discipled and, and to pursue Christ's likeness. We have only one place to turn, and well, that's God. That's the Bible. So true belief leads to seeking God's word. We would see ourselves hunched over our Bibles on a regular basis. But true belief leads to more. If we took a quick survey of verses 15 to 21, we would see again that Manoah simply believes and accepts what the angel has to say. There's no arguing or questioning. He seeks to be hospitable and prepare a meal for their visitor, just kind of like uh, Abraham did in Genesis 18 for the three visitors. Manoah is showing the same hospitality. But the angel refuses and instead suggests that they offer a burnt offering to the Lord. After all, their promised son was going to be a gift from God, and they would, should give him their worship and thanks. But again, look at verse 17. Did Manoah say, if your words come true? No. Again, he said, when your words come true. I keep highlighting this because Manoah shows his belief in the announcement, and he wanted to do something about it here. He wanted to give honor where honor was due. Just like, uh, and just like Jacob uh, asked God when he wrestled with him in Genesis 32, so Manoah asks the angel uh, his name here. But the angel knew what Manoah was getting at, and so he avoided answering the question, which effectively pointed Manoah back to God. And so Manoah and his wife prepare an offering. Now remember that offerings and sacrifices were the way the Israelite people worshipped God in their day. So Manoah, believing what he had been told, takes time with his wife to worship God for working wonders, as verse 19 tells us. Not only do they show this in giving their offering, but they show it in their actions in verse 20. When the flame goes up from the altar and the angel goes with it, Manoah and his wife bow down. They fall on their faces. You know, in an evil generation that was seeking after false gods, these two affirm their allegiance to the one true God. And so true belief leads to worship. That's our third point for today. True belief leads to worship. This is how we should respond to God's work in our lives, both the good and the bad. You know, I think of Job for a moment. How did he respond when everything was taken away from him? Job 1, 20 to 21 says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job worshipped. And I marvel at that amazing display of faith. He, he doesn't just praise God in the good times. He praises him in the tough ones as well. You know, I had a mentor in life who did the same thing. He had cancer, and when he found out, he quoted this verse. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His faith was absolute. True belief leads to worship. Or think of the ten lepers that Jesus healed. How many responded to what Jesus did and gave him thanks? Just one. Just one of them turned back and praised God and thanked Jesus. And he wasn't even Jewish. He was a Samaritan. All the people who said that they had true belief revealed by their actions that they actually didn't. Jesus even addresses this. Luke 17, 17 to 18 says, Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Were there just nine? Was not one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? True belief leads to worship. And true worship is seen in our actions. But there is one other thing we should see in this passage from Noah's example. Look at verses 20 to 23. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, 
he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. Now Manoah's worry comes from Exodus 33. When Manoah, or sorry, when Moses wanted to see God's face, God said in verse 20, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. See, Manoah had just realized that he and his wife understood that they were uh, talking to a supernatural being. They had spoken to him face to face, and Manoah was fearful that they will now surely die. But his wife gives a very practical answer. And her practical answer highlights for Manoah a better understanding of God. God isn't like the false gods that their neighbors worshipped, who people believe to be fickle and, and tricksters. God, the true God, is loving and faithful. He is dependable and consistent. You know, just because this is the way my brain works, if Manoah was the Grinch, I would say that Manoah's understanding of God grew three sizes that day. That was just a little joke for me. I still had to say it, though. True belief leads to a better understanding of God. It's our fourth point for today. True belief leads to a better understanding of God. This happens because the other actions of true belief are happening. When we're praying, when we're reading God's word, when we're worshiping him, then we're putting ourselves in a place where our faith and knowledge can grow. Spending time with God can help our relationship with him to grow. And so true belief leads to a better understanding of God. Now I want to talk to dads for a moment. If you're not a dad, don't tune out though. What you're about to hear is important for you as well. But physical dads and spiritual dads, what is our example in our family? Do our actions show what we say we believe? Is our family getting mixed messages? Or are we leading our family by our words and our actions? Are we praying? Are we reading the Bible? Does our family see us worshiping? Do we share with our family what we are learning about God? Because as I said earlier, parents are the primary spiritual leaders for their children. And dads are especially to step up in the family and lead. We are to teach them and train them to know who God is and how to live out our beliefs. You know, that's, that's not my job as a pastor. My job is not to teach your children how to live out their beliefs. It's yours. I'm here to equip you, and I'm here to help you. But you are the one that God will hold responsible for your family's faith and knowledge of him. And so as an application point for dads, it's twofold. First, think about your actions. I mean, even ask your family what your example is in their lives. And secondly, change what needs to be changed. Of course, this application point is for all of us. We all need to change what needs to be changed. If our actions don't line up with our beliefs, well, we need to repent of that, and we need to fix it. But the other way we should apply this passage should fall right in line with our first three points. If we truly believe in God, then we should first pray, and second, read God's word, and third, worship. These actions would mark our belief. We shouldn't engage in them hypocritically, only doing the action without the belief, that's not going to get us nowhere. Doing actions without the belief in God just shows that our true belief is more in ourselves than in our public image. No, we should do these things as a natural outpouring of the love and devotion that we have for God. And the amazing thing about God is that he gives us the grace that we need to uh, bring our beliefs and actions into alignment. So if you find yourself in a place where your belief and actions aren't into alignment, know that there is grace for that. Pray about it. Seek God's work in your life. True belief leads to action. Action reveals true belief. Let those line up together in your life today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your work in uh, Manoah and his wife and their life. Lord, to bring about Samson, who would one day uh, be a judge in Israel. Lord, as we look into your word and as we see just the absolute truth it contains, I pray that you would just write it on our hearts and that uh, we would change by it. Lord, there are times when um, we all see that our actions and our beliefs don't line up. Lord, whether it's a, a momentary stumbling or, or whether it's a habitual one, I pray, Lord, that we would just submit that to you now surrender it and, and that we would repent of it and change. Lord, we just thank you for your son. Thank you for the grace that you offer 
uh, to us through him, that through his death and his resurrection, we have uh, salvation. We can have a relationship with you. And Lord, that you are growing us in that relationship. So Lord, we, uh, we rely on you and we rely on your grace. And I pray that we would go forth from here, Lord, and that we would um, uh, just continue to work to become more Christ-like. Work in us, Lord. Change our hearts, change our minds. Lord, convict us of sin and help us to abandon it and to pursue you. We thank you for this day, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.